Disneyland for most is the place where you go to make your dreams come true. However, not all memories made here are memorable for pleasant reasons. So get comfortable as we celebrate the magic. Number one. My friend and I planned a day to go to Disneyland. It was originally going to be four of us, but my friend who was driving wanted someone else to tag along. The girl that was coming was the 16 year old daughter of some lady that went to my friend's church. And during this time, I am 18. We pick her up at our house and she's a kind of small petite girl and she just sits in the back of the car in between me and our other friend. I notice almost instantly that she is very timid and soft spoken. I thought she might be shy and right away she starts talking to me, just me, even though she knew everyone else in the car. This is the second time I met her. The first time I was at my friend's graduation party a month before, but I only said a few words to her at the time. The first thing this girl says to me is that she has cancer. I got really sad and thought maybe this is why she looked kind of frail. She went on about how she's staying in a local hospital half the time and her doctors are really nice. I didn't even ask what type of cancer she had. I was just concerned about making that day fun for her. But then she started talking about how her uncle raped her. By then, I'm thinking this girl has gone through a lot. But I was wondering why she was telling me all of this when she doesn't even know me. We get to Disneyland and we wait in line for the first ride. She starts telling us that the chemo and radiation is kicking in. I see her walk behind a tree and stick her finger in her mouth and force herself to throw up. By now I'm thinking that something's up and I ask my friend some questions. They tell me that she is a pathological liar. Okay, that would have been nice to tell me beforehand. Throughout the day, the girl was constantly trying to sit next to me on every ride that we went on, talking about her cancer and how she wants me to be there for her. She even pointed out a random stranger in the crowd and said that that was her uncle and she hugged me to protect herself. A few hours later, she did the exact same thing and points to a completely different guy. We use the rest stop, and when I'm done I realise everyone else is still in the restroom, except for her. She starts telling me that ever since the first time she met me, she knew that I was the one. She said that she felt this special connection to me, and that I was her knight in shining armour. It really freaked me out. Later on, my friends tell me that the girl actually has a boyfriend. I couldn't believe it, but sure enough, I go on Facebook and see pictures of them together, and it says that she's in a relationship. What? Why is this girl saying all of these things to me while she has a boyfriend? I was getting quite creeped out by this point, and I wanted to leave. But more than anything, I wanted to catch her in her lie. I asked her why she still has hair if she's supposedly been going through all this chemo and radiation. She turns around, and I shit you not, she pulls out a chunk of her hair from her scalp and says, See? I'm losing hair as we speak. This girl has issues. I asked her why she's flirting with me if she has a boyfriend, and told to her that she was wrong. She immediately said that she was going to break up with him and handed me the ring he gave her and told me to have it. On the way home, she opened my hand and handed me a thumbtack. I was thinking, what the hell? She said she wanted me to keep it, because this is from her, and that's the thumbtack that she uses to cut herself with. I did not want to be holding that thing. I just wanted to finally be home. On a side note, 
During the day we were talking about the colleges that we were going to in the fall, and I mentioned the one that I was going to go to. This girl said that she would be going there when she goes to college. I thought she was lying again, but I found out from my friend that her dad works at the college and that she gets free tuition there. So that happened to be true, but of course everything else was a lie. Two years later, I saw her at the school walking to class and tried to avoid her as much as I could. I did not want to go through all of that again. Number two. This all took place in November of last year. I booked an entire trip in order to propose to my then girlfriend, flew us both out to Florida to go to Disney World, and the last concert of one of our favourite bands, Amberlin, and of course propose. I proposed in the Disney castle, and she said yes. Everything went well. We then took off next morning, Thanksgiving Day, on the way home, we connected through San Francisco. About 30 minutes into the flight, the captain comes on the intercom and announces that one of the engines wasn't depressurizing properly. We do a loop back to the airport, get unloaded into the terminal as we wait for another plane to be readied. When we got to the terminal, my now fiance switched on her phone back from airplane mode and within a minute, she had 10 plus voicemails from the same number, which she didn't know. Fearing the worst, we called the number without listening to any voicemails. I knew something was wrong as soon as she started to talk to them. Her face went blank, and she didn't say a word. I told her to give me the phone as she did. I asked who it was, and the voice I heard back just sounded dead absolutely no hint of emotion to it. All he said was, I will kill you both as soon as you land in Seattle. I asked who he was again, and he just hung up. She said she had no idea who it was, and I certainly didn't know the voice. I called him back and he would answer, and he just repeated the time that we were landing. Little did he know that we were delayed. I used to work in telecom, and I pulled some strings to get a name and address for the phone number. Neither of us knew the name nor the address. She looked him up on Facebook, and she had one mutual friend with him, her ex-best friend. We will call her Karen. She was no longer friends with her, as they got wrapped up in heavy drug use and stole from my fiancé. We did a little more digging and found out that he was the boyfriend of Karen's new best friend. My theory is that Karen saw all the posts that my fiancé was posting on social media about the trip and the engagement, and when she saw the great time that we were having, she was pissed, and wanted to piss on our parade. I didn't take it as a joke, however. A death threat is a death threat, and in my mind, as meth heads, they could follow through on a whim. I called him and talked over his ramblings. I told him that I was armed, I knew where he lived and was not afraid to take action in my own hands. He hung up on me, so I called the Seattle area law enforcement and they told me to call back on a non-holiday. So I called the emergency line and they reiterated the same statement. We were on our own. We ended up flying in close to nine hours after the original arrival time. Once we landed, we both had a single voicemail. Hers, I assume, from the guy, and mine, I had no idea, as he hadn't been calling my phone. My voicemail was from my dad, who said he'd gotten a call from my neighbour, saying that the mailbox had been destroyed, it looked like it had been hit by a car, and that the mail was stolen from it. Her voicemail, however, was the guy screaming. Where are you? How dare you? And plenty of other threats and random yelling. I drove home and dropped off my fiancé at her house, insisting she not come with me to my place, in case someone was still there. They threw a brick through my window, with an old picture of my fiancé and Karen attached to it. 
I tried calling him, to no answer. I went to bed and covered up the window with a tarp, making sure my fiancé was okay. I filed a police report the next day, and said I couldn't do anything without seeing them on my property. We blocked everyone involved on social media, and went about our lives. I didn't hear from them for about three weeks, and then he sent me a picture of my fiancé working. I immediately called her and told her to go to the back of her work, a bubble tea shop. I then called more security and explained the situation, but by the time they got to the food court where the picture was taken, he was obviously gone. At this point I was done messing around, I knew his address and swung by and dropped off a note attached to a critical defence .4 bullet, saying, this is your last chance to leave her alone. This is your only warning. It's been almost nine months now, and I haven't heard a word or seen them again. But for both our sakes, I sincerely hope not to meet you, Tyler. Number three. I am currently a 14-year-old girl who was born and grew up in Hawaii, but I look more Hispanic than Hawaiian. I also have a horrible slur that sounds like I can hardly pronounce words. At the time I was around 8 and had reddish blonde hair which was horribly dyed and very unkept. There were 5 of us on this trip, me, my mother, Tawny, Travis and my sister's boyfriend Jay. The actual story, when I went to California My mum decided that we should go to a nearby swap meet in Orange County after we'd been to Disneyland. So at around 12 when we left Disneyland and took a creeper van to the place, it was not what I expected. It was a plain white building with some people lingering outside. And this is where I first saw him. He was a Hispanic male, fairly white skin tones, with black baggy pants and a white t-shirt that had stains everywhere. It looked as if it hadn't been washed in weeks. I paid no attention, as I was too busy fussing over the newly painted unicorn on my face. We left the car, and I was told to stay by my mother. Throughout the day, I kept seeing him. He got very close twice, and was in grabbing distance from me when I suddenly noticed him scurry away. I noticed that he kept whispering to his friend, dressed identically to him in Spanish. Travis is the only one of us that could speak broken Spanish. When we went to dinner, it was almost 5pm. He and his friend sat at the table parallel to us, and stared at us the whole time. As we were making our way out, My mum decided to make a sudden stop at this booth that was one of the largest. One side was clothing, and the others was toys and such. My mum let me go to look at the Pokemon cards that were on display about 10 feet away. From where I was standing, I could see her at the entrance into the store, but she could barely see me, and couldn't see the door either. Whilst I'm looking around, the creeper enters. He quickly walks into the aisle that I'm in, and starts speaking to me in Spanish. I was always a socially awkward child, so I quickly replied, I don't speak Spanish. He went to grab my arm, and forced me away from the aisle of Pokemon cards. My mother always taught me to toss myself on the ground and scream and cry if anyone grabbed me, so that's exactly what I did. Travis came whipping around the corner and faced the man, and Jay blocked the exit. The creeper laughed and told Travis in Spanish something along the lines of, This is my daughter. She's just throwing a fit, don't worry. Knowing what he said, Travis flipped his shit and grabbed the guy by the collar, and in clear English, That's my sister. And shoved him into the rack and punched him. Jay quickly picked me up and ran out of the store, leaving the creeper in the store with a lot to think about. The next day, 
Jay and Travis returned because my Pokemon game wasn't working. We bought it about three minutes after entering the shop when nothing had happened, and I overheard him telling my mum the guy was standing out front of the swapper meet with a broken nose, and apparently flashed a gun at them as they were driving away. This story happened to me when I was seven. I'm 18 now. So my mother and I, my mother being a single mother, decided to travel to Paris from Finland to see Disneyland and the city itself. Disneyland was amazing, and I loved every second of it. But even though we had two days left at the park, my mother insisted that two days before we left, we spent it doing a few more cultural activities, which I personally wasn't too keen on, but she insisted. So we left Disneyland that day to visit the most famous sites in the city, the Louvre, the Arch, the grave of the unknown soldier, the Versailles, even though it's not really in Paris, and of course the Eiffel Tower. We saved the tower for last. I kept looking at my watch thinking that we may just have time to go on a few rides later that day. When we got to the tower itself, I insisted on looking around various small souvenir carriages. I ran off to look at the stands without my mum, and after about 15 or 20 minutes of looking around different versions of the same Eiffel Tower keychain, I noticed that she was nowhere to be found. Initially, I wasn't too shaken up, since I'm sure my mother was sitting somewhere keeping an eye on me in the way she always did. I decided to walk a few more stands closer to the tower itself, and after a few minutes, I did a 360 look around to try and see if I could locate where she was, but to no avail. At this point I had started to panic, being a tiny Finnish boy in a foreign country, and with no understanding of French and barely any English, I grew only more anxious and scared of my situation. This is where the story gets creepy. Whilst walking around aimlessly and scared, trying to find my mother, I see a tall guy staring right at me, maybe 20 metres away, doing the finger gesture, suggesting for me to come closer to him. I was quite creeped out, and decided to turn around and walk away. Perhaps I'd be able to locate my mother, the next set of consequences I will never forget, and have possibly been the scariest moments of my life. From nowhere I see a long dark shadow in the ground, and I get a very uneasy feeling from the bottom of my stomach. I turn around to see the same guy standing behind me, with a huge grin on his face. He then proceeds to say something in French, but I stand there paralysed by fear. He then says something to me in English, with a very thick accent. Follow me, little blonde boy. Now like I said, I didn't really speak English at the time, but from watching plenty of American cartoons and movies with subtitles, I understood that. The man tries to reach out for me, but I start running from my life. I kept screaming for my mother, when out of nowhere, she appears, the man still running towards me as I run into her arms. My mother quickly asks me if I'm alright and what happened. I hastily explain my encounter and we both turn around so that I can point him out to her, but the man has literally vanished into thin air. The thing is, when he confronted me, we were nowhere near any buildings or vendor carriages, and the tourist crowds weren't awfully large either. After comforting me for a minute, my mum explained to me that she had to go buy a bottle of water from a vendor, and had tried looking for me afterwards. Safe to say, my mother stayed by my side for the rest of the trip, and didn't let me out of her sight again. I had several years to rethink the whole situation I was in. I still think to this day that I could have possibly been kidnapped. I can't help but wonder if those were his intentions or not. Maybe this man saw me, walking aimlessly for minutes trying to find my mother. But then again, who knows? I may have wound up in a completely different situation, if I hadn't have run when I did. Nevertheless, 
This incident has easily been the creepiest encounter of my whole life. Number 5 I worked at Walt Disney World for 4 years. Most days, I looked something like this. It was a fantastic job. I was happy every day. I left because I had to continue school. This experience happened at work, and was actually one of my last shifts before I'd be leaving the company for good. I was working at the restaurant Garden Grill, in the Land Pavilion at Epcot. The fun thing about this restaurant was the layout. There were two stories of the restaurant, and to further complete our rotation, you would complete one layer, go up or down the stairs, complete the other layer, and then go up or down the stairs again. The main goal of our set was to see every guest in the restaurant at least once, so there was only one way for our guests to go in and out, and that was down a ramp. The greatest part about working in this restaurant was the final set of the night. Usually by 9pm the restaurant would be mostly cleared out with 3 or 4 families remaining, and we would either be done with the set in 10 minutes and get out early, or we would have time to play around in the restaurant and have fun. This is my experience. It was the last set of the night. Three families left in the restaurant. Two lower, one upper. Four characters. Two began up, two began down. I started up and greeted the family on the top section. I completed the circle and was just about to go down my set of stairs when I saw the back of a man's head sitting just to the right of the stairs as I was about to descend. Well, I had to greet everyone in the restaurant one last time, so I came up to his table and signalled hello. He serenely, yes, serenely, turned to me, and grinned widely. He didn't have a drink, a place setting, and wasn't wearing a name tag like a manager would. Instead, he grasped the menu of the restaurant in his hands, and laid it down carefully on the table, when I waved. Why hello there, Dale, he said to me. His voice was slightly raspy. He had dark, slick hair, and was wearing a long sleeve button down shirt with a vest over it, and a tie. He also had a moustache, but had an otherwise clean shaven face. I thought it was cool that an adult male knew which chipmunk he was talking to. Usually, no one knows Chip from Dale. Again, I waved and extended my hand for him to shake. He gave me a firm handshake. I pointed to the menu and rubbed my stomach and held my arms out in a question mark position, asking, Are you hungry? It's odd because it looked like he had just been seated for dinner, but the restaurant would be closing in 15 minutes and stopped seating guests about 30 minutes ago. The man laughed and shook his head. Oh no, nothing for me today, Dale. I nodded and glanced over the railing to see if any other families or any other characters were in my view. None were. He spoke to me again. I'm just here to check up on things, see how things are going. I looked back at him, a little confused. I didn't react much because I started feeling strange. The man put the menu aside again and touched my arm. Through the fur, I felt static and a swift feeling of pride. Go say hi to the children down there. The restaurant is closing. Again, I nodded and gave him a salute. But before I moved to go down the stairs, I signalled to him. I pointed at my chest and put my finger to the table. I'll be back. He nodded. All right, Dale. I went down the stairs and rounded the other side of the restaurant and gave hugs and kisses to the last two families. All the other characters were already inside, done for the night. My captain, the character manager for the night said, found you Dale, took me by the arm, and went to guide me back inside. I gave her the one second sign, and ran back to the other side of the restaurant to find the man again. But no one was up there. The many were still in the middle of the table, instead of being tucked behind the napkin holder, but the chair had been pushed in. No one had walked out behind me whilst I was on the other side with the families. 
It's impossible. And the only other way out was through a door that leads to the kitchen and into the backstage area. But the man wasn't wearing a Disney costume, nor did he have a name tag on. I went through the backstage door and rejoined my fellow cast members upstairs. The instant I was up there, I brought up the man. I was greeted with, What man? The dad with the kids? Head shaking. When I went home that night, I reflected. I truly believed this was a paranormal experience. And at first, I thought I had met Walt Disney himself. However, I would have recognised him surely. And Walt never actually saw Epcot. Which led me to believe I met an Imagineer or some other sort of operator. It boggles me, because I knew something didn't feel right when I was interacting with him. He interpreted my pantomime too well, and knew the difference between Chip and Dale. Every now and then I start looking into Disney's past, looking through photos in the hopes I might recognise someone, but no luck yet. But his image is certainly burned into my memory. I always make a point now when I'm on Disney vacation to visit the land, and hang out there for a while, waiting to catch a glimpse of the man. For some reason or another, I feel like I will see him again. Number 6 This story takes place on a magical holiday. Me and my family had gone to Disneyland to celebrate my parents' anniversary. We went on Friday and stayed in this cute hotel and explored the park. Saturday afternoon, we had just eaten pizza and continued walking in the park. There was a labyrinth as an attraction, themed Alice in Wonderland. My sister was still pretty young, and she stayed with my parents and my uncle. As I was 14, I went ahead. There were loads of people, all following the same direction so it was easy to know where to go to find the exit. There were a few corners and turns here and there, but almost no one went in them. I'm walking way ahead of my family now, and I can't see them anymore, and they can't see me either, when suddenly, a woman appears before me. She's small, has dark tinted skin, and she starts following me, and then talking to me. First she speaks English, but at the time, I could only speak a little English. She sees I don't understand, so switches to German, French, and then Spanish. Now I can speak Spanish, and happy to finally be able to understand her, I reply, See? So she tells me that she knows the way out. I'm hesitating. There's something really off with the way she keeps smiling at me. It's a weird smile. And she keeps looking around anxiously. But I'm also curious, so I ask her which way. She gestures behind me, to a completely empty part of the labyrinth. And when I try to say that we should maybe just follow the people, and that my family is somewhere behind me, and start backing away, she moves quickly, grabs my arm and starts pulling me with her. I'm struggling, she's strong, and she says that she knows a better route, a shorter one. My mum appears around the corner, so I jerk myself free, and throw myself into her arms. The woman then mumbles something, and quickly walks away, in the opposite direction that she was pulling me. To this day, I still wonder what would have happened, with me, had my mum not appeared the second that she did, and had the woman been able to drag me with her. Number 7 I worked in the California Avenue after Buena Vista Street opened in Disneyland. One night I was cleaning the shelves in Trolley Treats, when the locked automatic doors just opened. Now normally I wouldn't think anything about it, but two fellow cast members behind me, just checking out the cash registers, just stopped and stared. I asked, did those just open on their own? And they both nodded. I shrugged and continued my work. About 10 minutes later, it did it again. This time I was alone. I got down and checked the door, but it wouldn't open even for me, so no idea what caused it at the time. I mentioned this to my lead, who told me that the whole trolley treat site and the old Burbank ice cream shop 
were haunted by a little girl who died in the parking lot when the DCA wasn't even a dream. She apparently liked messing with the boys and would tease male leads closing up by running up and down the aisles late at night. Number 8 Around 8 years ago when I was 14, I went on holiday to France with my friends and her parents. We were staying at the Euro Disney Resort, so we didn't have much contact with the outside world whilst we were there. On the third day though, we decided to go to a nearby shopping centre called Val de Europe. This place was massive to a pair of 14 year old girls. There were so many different shops that my friend and I tried to go in and decided to sit around the benches rather than continue shopping with my friend's mother as we were tired. That was when I first noticed two men in their mid 40s eyeing up me and my friend. They were both quite large, bearded men of possibly Middle Eastern or Algerian descent. Whilst we were still, and are freckled Irish girls. Me with red hair and green eyes and my friend with blonde hair and blue eyes. I started to get uncomfortable almost instantly while my friend thought that I was imagining things. I could see the men whispering and staring at us and they started getting closer and closer, eventually sitting in the area where we were in. At this point I asked my friend if we could move to the next set of benches as we leave, the men start to follow, confirming my suspicions. I'm getting pissed off as I can see them planning something, as they are now blatantly following and staring us. Being in a foreign country, I was even more on edge and didn't even know my surroundings or speak French that well. So I knew I was helpless if anything happened. Anyway, this went on for another 20 minutes or so, then following as we moved away. I had enough and was really freaked out. So we went to find my mum and told her what was happening. Meanwhile, they had followed us to the shop and noticed who we were talking to. We thought that that would be the end of it, but they actually went up to my friend's mother and asked her for information about us and if they could take us out. Needless to say, she was more assertive than we could be and they backed off. I clung to my friend's mother for the rest of the time there but they still followed us around from shop to shop until we left. While they never actually laid a finger of us or spoke directly to us, the idea of what their intentions were with two 14-year-old girls still freaks me out. <laughs>